Well, so, um, hello everyone. Welcome to the first annual, and I like to say that first annual International Women's Day event here at the Lundquist College of Business. Um, we're calling this Women's Day a pathway to success. For all of our webinar people who are joining us today, make sure you mute your audio and video to reduce background noise and continue to send in your questions via chat because we'll be taking questions after we're done. So thank you for joining us. Um, and thank you to our audience all for joining us here today. We have a very illustrious panel and I feel so lucky that all of these fantastic women who are the leadership of our college right now are here joining us here today. So first we have Whitney Wagner. Everyone applaud. <laughs> And she's the director of the Warsaw Sports Marketing. Then we have the fantastic Monica Bray. And she's the associate dean of the graduate programs. And then finally, I'm most excited because we have Sarah Nutter, who's the dean of the Lundquist College of Business. And so I'm particularly excited to ask these women questions. Um, this is for my interest. I think I, I'm the real winner here. Um, cool. And so we're going to just give it a start off and take it away. So I'm going to ask each of you these questions and you guys can answer in any order. I'm going to start with Whitney today. So Whitney. I picked the wrong seat. <laughs> <laughs> you either get really close and you're the last person or I'm No, you have to be the first person. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> so what have been the greatest successes you have experienced on your own pathway to success? Okay. Um, we got the questions in advance. So I have been, been, been playing. <laughs> I didn't read them. So. <laughs> I, I actually don't think about my path or my journey in terms of singular success moments. Um, I try in everything that I do to open the aperture a little bit and define my journey in a, in a length of time that is longer than shorter. Uh, and so I, I really don't point to singular moments. What I think about when I think about my journey and the degree to success that I have had is that I feel fulfilled. I feel really good about my life. I feel like I am contributing to the world around me in a positive way. Uh, and so there are little bits that happen and small achievements that sort of build towards something. Um, but when I think about myself and those around me, I tend not to sort of say, this was an achievement and this was an achievement. I try to look at the world a little bit more holistically. So, so successes have been a chain of smaller events that have created for me a life that I enjoy, that I feel good about, uh, and that fulfills me. Okay, Monica, you're next. <laughs> I think success is one of those things that's a little bit different. It's personal. It's, it's yeah. the, you know, how do you define success? Is it through well-being? Is it through you know, money you're making in a position? Or is it through you know, how much you serve your world around you or, or a mixture of all those. Things. So I think it's a, it's a difficult question in that sense. Um, professionally, if I look, I think you know, my success has been around program development, whether it's you know, doubling career services programs or graduate programs. But really, to me, the big success there is what you do in terms of growing the students professionally and, and academically and, and personally, right? We get to know our students very well here. We're small. Um, unit. And so I think that to me is my greatest successes. But I mean, so that's why it's a difficult question. Greatest successes on paper might have to do with program development. Greatest success, I look around and I think I enjoy to this day all the students that I've met, whether I've been teaching them and we stay in touch. Thanks. Thankfully, social media has been very, I think, helpful in that sense, right? Mm -hmm. So I need to stay in touch with my students from all the way back when I taught freshmen at SC to all the way here of the our graduating class from last year. So um, I think that to me is probably one of the greatest successes. And I would say my greatest success is the next one. So I tend to be a bit more um, uh, achievement oriented from the standpoint that you know uh, we'll, we'll we'll define a goal as a group and say we're going to go there, and then when we get there, I sort of go oh. And now we're going to go there. Um, so I think, you know, from my standpoint, it's always about the future and what comes next. Um, in terms of just generically, what do I take 
what drives me, which I think is really what success is about. It's, uh, you know, since I've been on this path, it's really about changing lives one person at a time. When I get up in the morning, I think about, you know, what am I about? It's how do we make the world a better place? How do we change lives one person at a time? We think about in the context of academics, I mean, one of the critical things is how do we change the lives of students one person at a time? How do we create an environment where they can thrive? And I think about those same things when I think about the rest of the college, too. If I think about just the college, is how do you make a college thrive mm -hmm. and build um, platforms that allow people to be successful? So that's really what drives me. I'm, I, I'm really more of a mission-driven or a missional person. So that will be the motivating factor. But the success is about the next thing, not the thing that's in my rearview mirror. So along similar lines, we've talked about success, but I'm also interested in the challenges that you have faced along the way. And so sometimes that is a little bit easier to answer in a rear view sort of mindset as Whitney was talking about. And so I'm actually going to start with Sarah. What have been the greatest challenges that you've experienced in your path? Well, I think one of the biggest challenges, um, I mean, I've not really often have not shared this, but uh, in academics, but even as a young professional, I worked at the government. I was in the IRS for about seven years before I joined faculty at uh, George Mason, my former institution. And, and one of the um, biggest challenges actually was a strange one. Nobody at work knew I had kids. And at that particular time, it was a, a context where if, if um, a man brought kid, their kids to work, it was like, oh, he's so wonderful, he's babysitting. <laughs> <laughs> if a woman brought her kids to work, it's, she's clearly not serious about her job. <laughs> so, you know, I think one of the interesting things that I really, and I, this is International Wednesday, so I think it's one of the things that I think we all should be celebrating, is actually, I think that I've been able to live a more authentic life around that in later in my career than I was ever able to do earlier in my career. Earlier in my career, my, my family and my kids and those kinds of things weren't something that were ever even present in my conversation. For example, I would never say, um, I've got to go pick up my kids from X. That is just something I wouldn't have said back in the day. Um, so, you know, from a challenge perspective, I think that, that um, lack of ability to live an integrated life early in my career uh, was one of those things. And what we know from academics in general and the research that's done in there, and I'm speaking in that context, but we know from the research that oftentimes the um, expectations on women for, for um, service, for contributing, is actually set at a much, much higher level. And I don't know if this is true in the in the business world of this same kind of work has been done, but in the academic world, it's true. It's that often the expectations around service are much higher for women than they are for men. And if you, are, you don't do it, you're penalized for it. So I think there was also this additional pressure early in my life. And I served in a lot of heavy service administrative roles because I could not have not done so. I don't know a different way to, mm -hmm. to, to say that. Um, but, but from the standpoint, I think the other one little point I'd make with that along the way, along with those challenges were people that were incredible mentors to me and they were men, women from all walks of life that came around to give, give me pointers. And I guess I would say along with the challenge, I would say the encouragement is how important other people are in your life in terms of those that can mentor you. And so that piece of it, I know it's a little bit off, but it's kind of an interesting artifact of my own personal history. I think for me, if, when I think about challenges, one of the things I see consistently, particularly when you go to larger organizations, is there's a tendency for people to you know, want to stay in their comfort zone, to stay within the status quo and to move that is, is challenging. And I think that relates also to women's day because you have to really make internal shifts before you can make external shifts. Mm -hmm. And 
if your environment hasn't made the shifts, whether it's uh, be supportive of women and all and all sorts of diverse um, initiatives, then it's difficult to move these things forward. So I would say those have been that's probably been the most challenging piece for me is um, the environments of you know, people get comfortable with where they are and they want to support the status quo, and not want to move forward. Um, and so then the challenge becomes how do you make those shifts? Sometimes. You know, it's as easy as getting a group of people together and speaking to them and, and seeing if you can find a common ground. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes you really have to stand your ground and say, this isn't right. <laughs> we need to do something. And so it's, you know, those, but amongst the kind of things that I would say have been challenges, I would say it's always kind sort of within the status quo, trying to move that out. And then all the institutions and processes and social mindsets and everything that support that and moving out of that to make that internal shift in an organization able to make that external shift. I think that's the probably the largest challenge I have probably come across consistently throughout my career. Very quick. <laughs> um, for me, it has been, let's see, how do I say? Uh, that there, there is a set of assumptions when I walk into the room about who I am and who I am not. Uh, and so I think the short way to say it is, is the challenge of, of having to defend and explain from the very beginning of an interaction of who I am and why I'm there. So, for example, uh, I used to work at the National Football League in New York City uh, in corporate sales. So I was a woman working at the highest level of sport on Park Avenue in a sales function. So there were not many women that were doing what I was doing. And so when I would come to a meeting, the first presumption was most of the time I had probably ordered the bagels in the car. <laughs> and so no one ever said that, but we sort of, you know, we're just doing a lot of small chit chat and they would sort of probe for like, OK, so when is, you know, the person who's coming going to come? <laughs> and I would say, oh, that's me. You know, you thought I was the bagels and juice person, but I'm actually here to propose a $200 million partnership. Right. And so just having to battle from the very beginning, the construct of fitting or not fitting what the people I was spending time with presume. Um, and I, I still face that a bit today in my role as the director of the Warsaw Sports Marketing Center. There's still oftentimes a very tangible, boom, that's a girl. Right. And it doesn't manifest itself in particularly egregious ways. But it just takes an extra couple of seconds for people to recalibrate, right? And so, again, I, I, I feel really fortunate that I have not had particularly negative or terrible things happen to me. Um, but I don't ever walk into a room presuming that the people I'm going to be with know to expect me and who I am and what I bring. And so I sort of miss sometimes that I don't have the privilege of walking in knowing everyone is expecting to see me this way in that conversation. Um, and so that sometimes is, is, is a bit of a challenge, just knowing, not having the luxury of knowing for sure that I fit what people expect and I have to give them a little time. To... <laughs> um, I'm going to start with Monica. This... Uh -huh. And so... <laughs> 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 Um, I love that this question's next because it goes directly to some things that Sarah was talking about. And so I want you to tell the audience your own mentors were, and I would love it if you would call them out by name because I think that would be kind of fun. Um, and then how did they help advocate for you? And then what advice can you give to the audience about um, what they should be looking for in developing these mentor relationships? I think that's a really good question. And I think when I look back on myself, or really, if you think about people's success, I don't know a single really successful person that didn't have some sort of very strong mentor behind them. Um, and so I think it's it's a really key piece of success. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and I've been, I've been really, really fortunate in this area. I think all of my former supervisors, wherever I was, to all of the graduate programming that I've done, all of it, I've met really extraordinary people and I've stayed in touch with them. Um, I can call one of them, several of them out. Some of them I might need to think of them before I call out their name. But I do know um, Frederick Roth is actually someone that comes to mind quite a bit to me. Uh, he was my, he was the head of the MBA program at Monterey Institute of International Studies. And 
Um, he was the head of entrepreneurship and portfolio by scholar, and he's now recently just retired. But I, I stay in touch with him quite a bit. And, and one of the things I would say about him, and I would say, um, you know, and also my the head of my program, my PhD program at SC, Professor Kennedy. What I would say about them that consistently, I think I noticed is that they believed in me before I believed in myself. And I think that's really important with mentors. You want to find one they they, they can see you before perhaps you can see them. And that's part of it, right? You want to find a mentor who's done their work and who was able to see you before you can, because that's the whole thing. You're the, you know, um, they're leading the, uh, I guess, the path for you. They're leading the charge and you're a little behind them. So you know, for them to be able to kind of see that is a really key piece. I think the second part was, you know, what would we look for in a uh, mentor? Yeah. You know, I think um, what I would say is that when I mentor students, um, I think it's just really refreshing to see when they have a very, um, they come to you really ready to take charge and they do something with the conversations and the advice you give them and they move forward. And I think the other thing that stands out from the people that I've mentored that I still see and I'll see them at conferences or wherever it might be is that they didn't let obstacles stay in their way. So I think that's also another really good attribute of being a really good mentee as well. You next? Sure. <laughs> um, we'll see if I can do this without crying because my mentor was Jim Warsaw, uh, the amazing man who started the Warsaw Center. We lost him to complications from Parkinson's in 2009. Um, and Monica is exactly right that he saw something in me that I didn't realize was as clear as perhaps I had thought. I think. I think the seeds of that were in me because I wouldn't have put myself in a position to meet him. I wouldn't have had something demonstrable for him to respond to. But nonetheless, he he gave me the confidence uh, to move forward. And his belief in me, no doubt, uh, put me on the path to the National Football League and, and things that, that came thereafter. Um, and after that, I think my own path and journey have been friendships more than mentorships, mm -hmm. um, much more from a, a set of peers than perhaps someone who was um, ahead of me in terms of experience or, um, or path. Uh, and the word that I think about most when I think about mentorship is authenticity, right? That these are authentic relationships with people. Um, yes, there is a sense sometimes of of little brother, big sister, molding, come on, kid, let me show you the way sometimes, but not every time. It is about a real, authentic human connection. Do you like this person? Does this person care about your well-being? Because you're friends, right? In, in a world where there is a lot of non-authentic engagement, this is that. Um, and so I always want to be able to be 100% myself, and I expect that the person that I am friends with, mentors with, mentees with, also is always authentically themselves. And I think that that relationship will never fully bear the fruit that is possible if both people don't come at it authentically with a real sense of caring about this person as another human being and having a friendship that is meaningful on a personal level. Yeah, so I, I sort of I'll mention two people. So I'll start with the first one. Uh, his name was Tom Hennessy. He was the chief of staff at George Mason University. And I met him first when I was an assistant professor and had a bit of a little bit of a challenge with um, a tenure case that I was involved in. Well, it was actually about me. <laughs> so um, I actually... Uh, Got some advice from senior, some senior professors who said, you really need to go talk to this guy. It's a long, complicated story, but, you know, we formed at that um, point, I would say, a um, positive relationship that was based upon uh, I'm mutual respect, trust, and I think he appreciated my chutzpah <laughs> of, you know, sort of taking the initiative to go tracking down and say, you know, any advice that you have for me? Who should I talk to? What should I do? I met him at, a, at, and this is where networking comes in. Networking is absolutely huge in finding mentors. I'm an accounting professor by background, and I had met him on the golf course because we were doing a fundraiser at a golf tournament for accounting. 
and happened to be on my team. So how did I make that personal connection happen to be in that context? And so when I had this little hiccup, I, um, I went and found him. And, uh, you know, he gave me terrific advice then. And we interacted. That was, that was probably six years into my career, five years into my career at uh, George Mason. We interacted sporadically throughout the rest of my time there, keeping touch on various kinds of things from afar. But then he came and he came to me when we were going through a presidential transition and said, you're the person, I was the accounting department head at the time, you're the person that I would like to come over and be part of the president's office because I've been watching you, I've been watching what you're do- you've been doing and you have such promise, I see that you're gonna be a, a big academic leader someday and I'd like you to give you that experience. So it was this kind of odd experience of meeting him on a golf course, young assistant professor, um, then going to him with a little chutzpah and saying, I got a problem, can you give me any advice? And him giving me advice that ultimately, well, I got tenure there, um, but you know, and on a timely basis. But, but, um, but then all those years later coming back, and him saying, you know, I really want you to do this thing because we really need somebody who can step up, lead this initiative at this big level. I ended up staying on two years of the president's office and then ended up back in the deanship of my um, former unit, the School of Business. So I, I think the story of that is you don't know exactly who your mentors are going to be entirely. I mean, some of them um, come to you by happenstance, by circumstance, but you should always be leaning in to looking to make that personal connection. So I think that one of the things I would say about mentors is you are likely to find them in unexpected places sometimes too. And so don't regard any interaction you have with anyone as being insignificant. So, uh, and the last part was related to qualities. Yeah. Of, 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 of a mentor. I do think with, if, if you want somebody be, to be a mentor to you, I think one of the things that you need to do is to be a partner with them. In other words, you need it to actually be paying attention to what they have to say, but also be seeking them, them out and being proactive about that in a positive way, bringing your whole self to the table. And if you bring, come a pro- with a problem, bring a possible solution. Say, I'm thinking about I should attack it this way. So referring back to my tenure case, it was saying, here's what happened. Here's the situation. Here's what the thing I think is the approach I should use. What do you think? And then he was able to sort of give me great guidance and feedback in terms of next steps. So I think coming into it with that attitude um, really um, makes a big difference. And then the last piece of this, because I want to mention one more person is my uh, great aunt Julia, because I think some of our mentors aren't just in our professional lives. Our mentors are also coming out of our personal background or experience. And so she was a woman that I actually had the privilege of just watching walk through life from a child. And it was those elements of her um, um, heroic and courageous and persistent behavior. She was a female. She worked as a social worker. She got an advanced degree, a master's degree when that was not common for women. She worked in inner city um, Grand Rapids, which is a, I had come from Michigan. So it was kind of an inner city school with very challenging um, problems, worked with the most challenging students. And always the, her, her byword was love is spoken here. And what she meant by that was she came into every situation with the families trying to find a a way where everyone was honored. Um, So I was just able to watch her sort of overcome obstacles, being a female in that field with an advanced degree was not an easy thing at that time. And she worked in a context that one could describe as incredibly emotionally charged um, throughout her entire career. Career and did it with such grace and and um, wisdom, even to the point that she was being called back as a mentor to those that followed her long after her retirement. And so, you know, I, I guess the other point I just want to make is sometimes your mentors aren't people that are in your professional life; they're in your personal life too. 
and both are equally as important. So Whitney, you mm-hmm. get to go first this time. Okay, I'm ready. I know you love it. So who are the people that you have mentored that you are most proud of? And then Monica touched on this a little bit, but what are the characteristics that made you want to mentor them? Yes. Um, every student I have ever had <laughs> is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I would just go back to authenticity again, but, but more specifically to be open, right? If you are seeking advice, listen to the advice, hear it, right? Um, I will admit that some days when I have a busy brain and a busy to-do list and someone says they want my opinion and then I get yeah buts for the next 30 minutes, right? Mm-hmm. If you're asking... For someone's point of view and perspective, be open to hearing. That doesn't mean you have to take the advice, but if you're already so guarded that I can't finish my sentence about how I see your experience, um, that's not going to lead to a fruitful outcome. So authenticity and openness and, and honesty, I think whole self is another great way to describe it, right? I cannot contribute. I cannot help you. I cannot assist you if you don't come open and vulnerable and really eager to act on that. Um, So I guess sort of openness and authenticity um, and a little bit of courage. I would echo that. I think I will go to my career and read my am in higher ed, just a little affair with higher ed, is because of the students, really. And so you and staying in touch with them. So it's been a real honor and a real pleasure for me as well um, to mentor students. Sometimes, when, you know, as you go through your life, you get a little, I feel like sometimes our ideas get a little stale. And I, it's so nice to be able to talk to someone who's, you know, in a different, from a different generation, who's going through a different path, who has different ideas. And it really, that's why I think it's been just, I think maybe even more rewarding for me to have um, students to mentor and and from all walks of life. And I really, 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 that's probably the thing that I look forward to most to in a day to um, see if, you know, what social media pop-up I get from who. And it's just really fun. Um, I can say that my children don't really fall in that category and try very hard. <laughs> it really hasn't worked that well, but... Uh, because, you know, the qualities that we were talking about, I think, are important. But if you do approach them, then um, it, you want to have a connection with them. You want to have a genuine, you want it to be beyond what, what can you do for me, right? Because a real, and eventually things will happen. And in life, that's just normal when you interact with people, things will happen. So rather than having such a focus on that, perhaps the focus would be better to be more about, you know, how can you engage with this person? What can you bring to the table? What can they, how can they help you? And I know for a fact from my mentors that I absolutely, they, they bring on the world to me every day. So I think that's a, that's a critical component to remember all the value you would also bring to them. Um, and that, you know, they do things with what they say. <laughs> you know, I always, I really love that. When I we talk about things and I suggest something and then I see something that's done, it's a really great feeling. And of course, I've been higher ed too, so I would say students, but that hasn't been the main focus of my career in more recent years. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, when I, I think about the people that I've mentored in more recent years, it's been faculty and staff uh, and uh, that are really looking to make career progression or they're looking actually just for how do I make this life work? So I was department head for a long time and it's really tough being faculty. Those of you that are at students, I uh, don't appreciate all the demands that are on faculty to balance their research, to balance their family, their teaching responsibilities, service responsibilities that, you know, they they um, have to contribute to. And so how to put all those pieces together and live in an integrated way is a very difficult thing. So, uh, you know, we used to do a lot of mentoring as department had setting up three-year plans for people. And we're talking about for a three-year period of time, how can you organize your life so you can live Authentically, I think is a great word that's been used already um, so far, uh, and progress. And a similar thing over on the staff side, because staff are managing a lot of things as well, and they're balancing a ton of balls. Uh, and in many situations, I don't think any institution in higher education is what we call resource rich, at least I haven't been at one of those places yet, um, where people are stretched thin. So how do we um, make, have the biggest impact? that we can. And so 
in terms of, you know, those kinds of relationships, I spent a lot of time on actually through the years. Um, uh, back at my former institution, there's still people that are calling me on the phone saying, what do I do about X, Y, and Z, uh, and trying to sort of sort things through. And I, that's actually one of the most rewarding things because... As you're, you know, Monica mentions our kids don't listen to us. And so, you know, <laughs> it's kind of nice to have, you know, somebody who actually appreciates our perspectives um, uh, in life. And, and uh, you know, I, it, actually, it actually is one of the most rewarding things. One of the things you hope is that people can learn from the mistakes that you've made because we've all made plenty of mistakes. Um, but also can learn from the successes that we've had in terms of things that actually were good strategies that worked. So I'm about to ask a question that's always asked of women at every panel I've ever seen, but I think it's actually relevant to the men in this room because you guys are in general millennial children here. So how have you balanced your work and professional life? Have you made any trade-offs and was it worth it? Are you starting with me? Yes. Oh. <laughs> uh, yes. I think I, I don't think I don't think I don't think any um, person alive cannot have to balance their life and make trade-offs. Um, I think as as uh, you know, um, a mom, as a um, as an educator, as a uh, person that's engaged in in lots of other activities that you're always making those trade-offs. And I think there's a lot of pressure. It's not just on women, it's on men. There's a lot a lot of pressure in today's world. I mean, I, I told you the story already of, you know, how people didn't used to know I had kids. There was a period in, in our world when that was kind of the, the way it had to be. When I was a PhD student, there was only one man on the faculty, or one female on the faculty. You know I mean, so, I mean, the idea that it, it was a very different world back in those days, I think... The thing that I have probably one of the, the largest um, respect and excitement about is actually people have opportunities now to be more authentic about making those trade-offs. And men as well, you know, have, have, can, and can talk about, I hope you can talk about your kids at work if you've got them and you, and you can and you know, think in a, um, a broader way. Because I, I actually think our society is overall in a much better place than it used to be. And so... Um, uh, based on my own experience, at least, and it's not that there, we don't have a long way to go, so I'm not suggesting that, that that's the case. But, um, yeah, I did make trade-offs. I, I made trade-offs in terms of what uh, college I taught at. Um, my husband had a job, and so I was looking for something in the D.C. market, and I made trade-offs. But anybody who has a partner is going to find themselves in that same place of making trade-offs. And when you have kids, you decide to have kids. You're going to make trade-offs. That's just life, and you know, the the uh, it's a challenge. It's a privilege. It's it's exciting. Um, but I will would say that we, if I compared 25 years ago to today, we live in a much better world, and that people people can make those trade-offs in a way that I don't think I had that choice. Yeah, I think we all make trade-offs. I think it comes down to really priorities. Yeah. What are your priorities? And that's really based on the personal thing. Who are you and you know, what do you want to do with your life? And then whether it's worth it or not, as you were asking, we'll probably be dependent on that. Um, in some ways, I was pretty lucky. I, I was raised by a father who's a feminist. So I came into the world not even really... I walked around thinking, okay, <laughs> so I'm not any different or worse or less or whatever than... And so then the world kind of taught me some of the lessons rather than my family, in essence. Um, so and, and it's been, you know, it's been interesting because I've seen some of the trade-offs that um, some of my family's made or friends. Or, and sometimes I think, you know, they're worth it and sometimes they're not. I think back to a time when I was starting a family, I had my own business, and I was a graduate student at USC. It was too much. That trade-off wasn't worth it. That was just... I look back, I think that was crazy. So, so I don't think, you know, that was a bit much. Something had to let go. And eventually, I support the business. But um, I think that it's, it's really a personal issue to mm -hmm. your priorities and what you, But at the end of the day, what I would say is that you really want to stay true to who you are. Because I don't think there's any kind of magical, like, balance. Or, <laughs> it's, it's who are you and what do you want to do with your life? And you look back, or you, 
Is, is that trade-off going to be worth it to you? Really? And I would say at times, my trade-offs have been worth it. At times, I don't know. <laughs> it's been problematic. <laughs> Um, I love this question, and I love getting asked this question in, in an environment like this because I get to give my little bit. I'm sitting on a red chair, so I get to give a little bit. <laughs> so I have a I have a hypothesis. Maybe I need to get it trademarked, or I'm going to write a book about it or something. I don't know. So here it is. Work-life balance is is a predicate that I don't even buy into. Okay, it is it is linear. First of all. Okay, that's a linear concept. Think about a seesaw, any sort of balancing act, it's linear. And we know, of course, that life is not linear. So already, it's a problematic metaphor. The other problem with the metaphor is that it's a fixed pie. That was the economic word. Okay? <laughs> that's a fixed pie, right? Seesaw. If I want to move this, I must definitively take something from this. Fixed pie concept, also not the world we live in. So I submit to everybody the work-life do. Okay. <laughs> so think about sort of, you know, your favorite autumnal soup, right? And it's got potatoes and carrots and maybe some beef or maybe some pieces of tofu and a little celery, right? It has a lot of different ingredients. Every bite of the stew is a different mix of element, right? And you don't say after one bite when you happen to get all potatoes, what's wrong with this stew? This stew is terrible. This is, is this an all potato stew. Right? We don't say that because we know, well, well, all the other ingredients are still in the bowl. The next bite I take will have a new and different, unique mixture of the elements. And so you judge the quality of the stew after the meal. And you actually don't go back and say, well, any, any individual bite was out of whack. I had one that was too meaty and one that was too potatoey. We don't do that. We say, in the end, that was balanced and nice. So, so think about that, Stu, or some other nonlinear metaphor that you'd like to use, right? Um, and again, it, for me, it just goes back to how I opened, which is broadening the aperture of what we define, right? In any given moment, it is out of balance, right? Right now, we are not somewhere because we are here. And so we start to create tension in Ajda when the defining moment of time of balance is too small. So broaden out a little bit. And for me, that was a really liberating sense when I would say, okay, today is not in balance. This week is not in balance. But the totality of my journey will be. And if I get caught up in how the minutia of today feels, I'll go nuts. So have another bite of stew. Trademark. <laughs> Trademark. <laughs> so I'm going to do one last question before we move on to the audience and, of course, our webinar participants. And I'm going to start with Whitney. Okay. We're going to go back this way. Okay. It's about crackers. and No, no it's not about crackers. Stay with potatoes. So looking forward, what do you want to accomplish in the next five to ten years, both in the Lundquist community and beyond? Okay. Um, for, for Lundquist, I, I, I want us to continue to serve our students in the very best way possible. And I, and I, I hope that we can do that um, in the 21st century world of what higher ed is. I think, I think a lot about the environment of higher education is changing. And, uh, you know, it's 2018. And so the world is different. And the role of higher ed in a different world is different. And so I am motivated to, to drive the collective forward on behalf of our students and for the university to serve a purpose and, and a function for them that meets them where they are in a world that is new. Um, and, you know, I just want to be happy and feel like I am contributing and that the gifts that I have are being shared to the best of their ability. Uh, and that sometimes I sleep and sometimes I snuggle with my kids and you know, sometimes I go to the beach. So I just want to feel good with the holistic sense of, of where I am and what I'm doing and who I'm surrounding myself with. Um, and that's going to be a good day. I think for me, going forward, um, and it is something that you know, I think of every day, it's how can we be more globally connected? How can we be more diverse? And how can we be more collegial? I think those are the three pieces that I think I go to. Um, and as, I hope as we go forward, we will advance in these kinds of um, areas as well. 
Um, I saw a post the other day, and there's a school that started that is about teaching happiness to children. <laughs> I thought that was just very interesting. It was actually one of our colleagues here in the finance department <laughs> who said that to me. And I thought that was a very interesting kind of uh, piece as well. And I think those things are just as important as the other pieces. And I, at least I know for me, where I learn most is when I've been in an environment that is supportive. Um, so I think the environment you're in is very important as well. And, and I hope as we move forward, um, we continue down the path of being more diverse, more globally connected and engaged, and more collegial. You're asking the dean this question. Yeah, I know. This is why you're finishing up. <laughs> so, okay, so, so sort of this is the five one respects, but let me just start with what a university really is. So let's begin there. And you know, what is the purpose of a university? And this is resistant to, to change. And so in many respects, a university is, is built to have, create well-educated, career-ready graduates. That's its number one priority. And so notice that what these two women both said, it's connected in many respects to the student experience. That's really the number one priority. The second thing that makes universities unique is they produce research that transforms society, that there actually is thought leadership, there's work that's done that changes the way we view the world, that transforms society, the research that transforms society. And the third thing that universities do is they're the economic and cultural engine for their region and for the world. And so if we think about those three pieces of the puzzle, and we think about the Lundquist College, and we think about the University of Oregon in itself, think about who and what we are. You know, how do we produce well-educated, career-ready graduates? So how do we create an environment where, you, as students, you're getting not only the knowledge, the skills, and everything else that goes with it, but I'll sort of lean back to something that Monica said, that you have both also an entrepreneurial and global mindset. Nothing happens in the context of business today that isn't globally connected. Nothing that happens in business today doesn't require you to have a level of entrepreneurial thinking that, frankly, if I look to my parents' generation or even... Well, I don't know if I want to say my generation, but I'll say my generation. In one sense, we could expect in many respects to have get a job, stay in the job, and go, stay with that same company, and then leave that job. The students of today are facing a very different world. It's expected that you'll have six to seven career moves. It's expected that you may found your own companies. It's expected that you will be thinking globally because we live in a globally connected world. And so all of those features are somewhere where I think the business school and the college here is really going to lean in. How do we produce well-educated, career-ready graduates? I'd personally love to see every single student on, on a graduate and graduate. Well, in graduate, they do in many of our cases, a year of professional experience whether that's through experiences that you have here at the Lindquist College and are done in partnership with the centers and with other activities that we have in the building or internships with companies, because now that's what they expect. They expect to see that you have real world experience coming into that. Some of you here are thinking, I'm going to start a business. Well, we need to be part of helping you do that. And we also need to be thinking about how do we leverage technology to help you accomplish that in a real way, in the technology-connected world that we live in. When we think about research that transforms society, I think about the amazing work that's being done by our professors even now on things like Bitcoin and blockchain, and I could go on and on about all the amazing work that's being done by our professors that really will help you as students get an edge, that next step be on the cutting edge of what is still to come and transforming the way business that gets done even as we speak. So this crazy thing called blockchain is going to disrupt entirely financial institutions. You're going to learn about that, by the way. If you haven't taken a course in that, you'll figure that out. The things that we're understanding about how do you team and how do you team globally that some of our faculty are working on when you're working on very diverse groups 
Your comment about diversity is very well taken. We need to be looking at how do we really embed diversity in everything that we do and how do we make that. And we have, we have actual faculty that are studying that kind of thing. Um, so that research that transforms society. And then when we think about the cultural and economic engine, you students are the economic engine of the future. We're going to be really leaning into entrepreneurship and innovation and helping you develop an entrepreneurial innovation in terms of a mindset. We're going to be cutting edge in terms of what we're training you on. Business analytics is disrupting every single thing that's happening in business, from accounting to finance to marketing, sports analytics. Um, all of these things are being disrupted by a technology, so it's going to be less important for you to understand how do I program, and much more important for you to understand how do I ask the right questions, and then when I get some output, how do I interpret and translate it? The world is desperately in need of translators, and so we're going to be educating the translators of tomorrow. Now, we have some strong verticals in this college as well. Really strong fundamentals across the board, from finance and accounting all the way across the spectrum. I'll highlight sports business because it's something we've been known for for a really long time. You can expect that we're gonna lean into that even more. So five to 10 years from now, what do I expect? I expect that people from around the globe are gonna be coming to the Lundquist College because they know that here, their lives are going to be transformed, they're going to leave forever changed, and they're going to change the world. That's my personal. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, now we're going to open the floor for questions for our panelists um, and also from our various people with the webinar. I, I like how I'm pointing to our person who's doing the webinar. And so um, please raise your hand if you have any questions. Uh, Julianne. Um, Whitney, this question is for you. Um, going back to your trademarks, too. Yes. Yeah. Um, for, I'm sure for a lot of us, depending on, I mean, whether or not we're older or younger, like that's the first time we sort of heard someone look at it non linearly at sort of the seesaw. Or even like I ran into Oling in the bathroom yesterday, like, oh, I'm having trouble juggling work life, like, and doing this balancing seesaw yes. motion as yes. it's, it's one or the other. And, Obviously, a lot of us are here because like work and life aren't necessarily separate things. Like work, if we really love it, is a huge part of our lives. Yeah. Um, what led you to realize that or what led you to the thinking of this new way? Like it's, in, instead of it being nonlinear, since yeah. I've never heard this, like what made you, was it a mentor that told you that? Or was it something you just like took a bite of stew and realized like, this is what I want my life to do? <laughs> I mean, just sort of think about it in like a whole different way, like completely different yes, way. Yes, um, being totally miserable all the time, <laughs> okay? Because I, I had bought into the conditioning of the linear thinking, right? And that is, th that is natural. It's what we see all the time. We see a linear fixed pie version of the world all the time. And so I, I, I had struggles early on, especially when I had my two children that I always felt like I was in the wrong place and it couldn't process. Well, if I'm sitting here, that means I'm not with my babies. And then if I was with my babies, it was like, oh, but now I'm not at work, right? And so I just got tired, Julianne. I got tired of feeling in any context that I should be in the other place. So I, I knew that I couldn't sustain feeling that way. And I also know I wasn't the only person feeling that way. And so I just said, there's got to be a different way to think about it, right? Because none of this is going to change. I'm not going to not have my children. I'm not going to be a stay-at-home mom full-time because I knew that wasn't who I was in my core. So what can I change? Well, how I'm thinking about it and how I'm responding to it, I can change. And so I, it was a, it was a self-coping mechanism to try to grasp at something that could help me process it, knowing that the actual it probably was not going to change that much and the world was not going to change around how I was feeling. So out of self-preservation, I worked and thought and journaled and took lots of bubble baths and 
they're gone wide. <laughs> and I just tried to find a way to think about it in a way that worked for me um, so that I could get through it all and feel comfortable in my skin wherever I was at any moment. Um, and so it was a, a, a self-opening. So uh, one of the things that you were talking about is sort of how far um, everything has come for women professionally, um, talking about you know, in the last couple of decades and all that. Um, where do you see it going into the future? Uh, because as somebody who's getting an MBA and is thinking of marriage and thinking of kids and thinking about my career and being all excited about all of this, um, I get a little bit scared by what I see now. Like I, I get this new thing that I also see, you know, people in my office come back after very short maternity leave and leave tiny babies at home and it wears them out. And I see all of that. Where do you see that going for women professionally 10 years from now, 20 years from now? Are you looking at me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what I see is us getting in cognizant of recognizing the child has parents. Not always, but often has parents. And in that context, I think there's a better recognition that as a female, you're not the only. Um, and so you see, you see, um, European nations are far more progressive in this regard, I think, than we have been. Uh, so I think you're seeing global trends of recognizing that you know raising children is is a, a family affair. I mean, it's a bigger conversation than it used to be. I don't think it erases uh, for any of us. It erases that internal conflict that Whitney has raised, because I think we are integrated people. I mean, we have, as she says, at her core, she knew she 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 wasn't going to be a stay-at-home mom, a mom only. That she also had an interest in this other thing at her core, and so I don't think it's going to erase the internal conflict that we feel because we have many roles in our life. Um, but what I see just generally is I generally see a broader conversation that I think is going to continue that's going to recognize that if we are going to have a workforce that's durable, <laughs> sustainable, um, and able to contribute long um, into the future. In Europe, they're actually talking about raising the retirement age to 72 because they're looking at lifetime our lifetimes as being not, you know, old Social Security, you were supposed to, like, retire at 62 and die at 63. That's the way the whole system was set up in the United States, right? That's how it was set up. But, but our lives are much longer than that now, at least from an expectancy perspective. And I think, again, other nations around the world have maybe gotten ahead of us in terms of their thinking on this. But at the same time, I think it's infusing back into our conversations a broader view. So I don't think you're, you're going to be able to erase all of your anxieties. That That's just part of life. But at the same time, I think the context is much better for open conversation than it used to be. And maybe one way to illustrate this is with a woman that is um, a, a decade or so ahead of me, who is mentoring a woman that was in her 30s. And we had just had a child. And she said, I told my boss that it really wasn't going to work for me to come back full time. But we worked out an arrangement where I could do a job share, where I did a half a job and, you know, then somebody else did half a job. And this older woman literally burst into tears. And she, the younger woman couldn't understand. And the older woman said, you have no idea what we endured, so you had the right to ask that question. And so I think we need to keep asking the question. I think we need to keep having the conversation. And it's not a one-sided conversation. This is for the men and the women about how do we live in a world where we can contribute across all our domains for a really long time because 
Most of us, at least, are not going to die according to the Social Security tables of 1932. And our careers and opportunities are going to extend over a much longer time frame. If I could interject another fixed pie problem. <laughs> um, I, I am hopeful, and I put a lot of responsibility on your question, to how women treat other women. Okay. Because part of my problem early on that I was experiencing, I'm in the wrong place all the time, were the looks I was getting, either dropping my babies off at the place and feeling, whether it was real or not, that everybody was like, there's Whitney again, leaving her children with strangers. Right? I felt that, right, from women, I felt that. And I have also felt the reverse, where... I, oh, you're doing this thing again? Oh, you're leaving your kids again to go to China with your students for two weeks at a time? So, so there's pressure, spoken, unspoken, side-eye, media, there's pressure. And a lot of times we do it to each other as women. And so the future that you want to have depends on other women making sure that they are not making that more difficult for So we're going to do one last question, and we'll do it from Mercedes. And then, but then after we're done, we're going to go upstairs, and you guys get to ask all of these amazing women um, questions face-to-face. Uh, -face. So Mercedes, okay. last question. Well, to kind of play off what you just said, I think my struggle on higher ed has been that the lack of female mentorship. Um, I think it's telling that you all mentioned your mentors, and presumably they they're all men. And so for me as a woman of color, trying to find that mentorship because everybody that you may want to be mentored by, it has to be a two-way street. And so just as women, um, maybe the role of women mentors in your life or how to go about that. Actually, one, the second person I mentioned, her name, so it probably didn't get across it, um, was a woman, very intimidating. She was the head of my PhD program and very instrumental in my life. Um, and it is important to have, um, I think, mentors women, men, all kinds of mentors. I think that's really, uh, the more mentors you have, the better off you are. And I think, you know, part of when I was thinking about what Whitney was saying is, you know, I because I grew up with the father who really just treated me very much like, you know, he was uh, quite the feminist and he really um, drove a lot of um, movements for women. Um, and so in that household, I think when I had children, I actually was, I was always, you know, I came across these kinds of thoughts and I didn't understand them. I was like, well, I think it's better for my children to have different perspectives and meet different people and have interactions with more people than just myself. And so my fundamental belief, um, I think, helped me not have that struggle as much. And I think it is. Um, as we move forward, I would say that's a, a, a piece of it. If you're moving out of one sector of, of kind of the work pie and into another area, the whole thing has to shift a little bit, right? You can't just take all of the home stuff with you to work and then do I mean, that's I never even thought of that because I think that's just out there. <laughs> I, but I know that I have a lot of friends who think, okay, I'm gonna do all of the family and home thing and I'm not gonna do a full time this and and every time I see it it just it's really not um not a sustainable way to, to be. So I I think like Sarah said and what he said you need to spread, and he's very happy to do so, but I think, actually, for me, my personal perspective, it's in the best interest of the child to have more perspective. So to be able to get more of a community involved um, is important. With respect to getting mentors, I think, um, you know, they can be anywhere. I uh, Some of my friends that I was growing up with, I remember people would come to my house, and they would, my father was quite the orator, so they were always very um, taken uh, Love being with them. So, what happened to me actually, ironically, was I would hang out with my friends, and um, many of them had parents that I thought quite highly of, and, and I be they became my mentors as well. So, there you can find them anywhere, whether it's through families, through, uh, and I think all three of us are happy to, yeah. to help anybody here um, in terms of mentoring people. Well, and I, I think I would add on to that too. Um, there were women that were mentors of mine, but when I was coming through, there were very few women. Um, so I think the one one uh, thing that is in your favor right now is that there are more women that are in 
higher, if you're thinking in higher ed, that if you're in whatever business you're in, there are more women that are in senior positions than there used to be. And I will say um, in my first appointment too, even there, when I had a small administrative appointment, there was a woman, she was the only woman in higher administration at the university that I joined. She actually reached out and just did a, it turned out to be sort of a semi-annual luncheon kind of a thing where she took the initiative to do that to create sort of a small network. And so um, our university is actually beginning to do this here now too with sort of a leadership um, a, a leadership forum that will provide opportunities for those that are interested in a more formulaic way in a programmatic way to get involved. But I would, you know, pay attention. And I, you know, personally have some ideas of some great mentors um, at this particular university because they, uh, we're fortunate here to actually have a growing uh, level of senior, senior leadership and administrators at this university. But what I would say is I think it's a little bit different, but I wouldn't, um, at the same time, I, I think that you'd be surprised at how many um, men are like your father that just are really looking for talent uh, to mentor and, and very uh, willing to do so. And so it's, it's sort of a combo affair, but I think there is an intentionality about it mm-hmm. to keep your eyes open. And if you see somebody you think you can learn something from, mm-hmm. ask them a coffee. I mean, literally just send them an email and say, hey, I would love to meet you for coffee. Um, because I think the the probability that they would say yes is extremely high. And sort of to close out, um, I've had lots of conversations with women here um, in the past five years. And if you look at the leadership that we have at this point in time of the Lundquist College, it's absolutely <laughs> amazing how many women we have in leadership positions All of our deans, all of our associate deans, three out of our uh, five center directors. That's absolutely amazing. And so and also the head of math, too. So I want to throw something out there for math. But I think that we are honored and we are so lucky to have all of you with this great experience that you get to share with us. And hopefully you guys can be some mentors to some people in this room. (laughs) So thank you so much for coming today. And everyone else, please join us upstairs. So let's give our panel a round of applause. Thank you.